asked was a lot about the hijab. Uh, so it was uh, about the hijab, I was getting a lot of questions. Um, so I thought, okay, um, maybe uh, by writing uh, a book, I can answer all the questions in one book, and then uh, I don't get the questions anymore, and the opposite happened. <laughs> but um, yeah, this idea came uh, while I was in the military, actually, because uh, I was uh, in a place where there were like 500 uh, soldiers, and I was the only Muslim. Uh, so even though I felt like very included and I loved the people, I sometimes felt uh, lonely. And then I started like looking at the internet, and um, there is one uh, this other girl in Norway that wears hijab, had to, who had made this uh, documentary clip, where she went around in Norway and talked to different people, uh, both Muslims and non-Muslims, and there was, she was like asking. Um, their opinions on the hijab and uh, uh, people who wear it, like why are you wearing it? And then uh, that gave me an idea because I had all these Instagram followers uh, from all around the world. And then I thought like, oh, we could actually do something together. And then I just posted the same questions. And it opened up for like all these stories and all these uh, opinions. Uh, and I was like sitting and reading the reading until like 3 a.m. Uh, and then uh, I just got the idea there. Like, if I need, if I really needed to read this, then probably someone else does as well. Right. And then I sent a mail uh, to a book publishing, uh, and they answered like the next morning. Yeah, we like your idea. And then we <laughs> wrote the book. That's fast. <laughs> <laughs> that's really cool. Was that um, that sort of opportunity to? Um, you know, answer those questions for people and be able to share other stories. Um, was that, how did that feel to you? Did that feel more like a responsibility because of, because you're in the public eye or did that feel um, like an opportunity and something that you sort of had the privilege of being able to do for your community? I feel like after Scrum, they have, uh, it has been, um, I have a privilege and I, it's not like, it doesn't happen every day that a Muslim girl gets such a voice. Uh, so it's absolutely a voice I'm gonna use as long as I have it. Um, so it was absolutely a, like an opportunity. At the same time, it was very important for me with the book, like this is my story. It's my story and uh, it's the life I've lived and it's my relationship to the hijab. And I'm not talking for anyone else. Uh, and that's why I think the stories are so important in the book because they show that there's no uh, there's no specific answer, but it's like so many different stories, so many different reasons, uh, and that the book shows like all Muslim girls are also individuals, like everyone else. Right. So you have the hijab in common, but other than that, you're all very different people. Yeah. Right. Um, <laughs> For those of us who uh, you know can't read Norwegian, would you mind um, kind of just you know summarizing your story and maybe one or two other examples of um, you know the reason that somebody else might choose to wear hijab? Yeah, um, for me, um, I grew up looking very up to my my mother and my uh, older sisters, um, and they were wearing hijab. And my mother, she converted to Islam for 30 years ago. Um, and she is my, my biggest role model because the choice she made, and especially at that time, was very big. And uh, she like went against her society and community and, uh, and parents um, who like didn't totally agree with her choice at that time. Uh, and she stood very strong and she still does. Um, so she has always like been an inspiration to me. So I grew up like always wanting to be like her. Uh, and then I had like a very different um, way to see Islam through my like father and my mother. Because my father is born Muslim and he's from Tunisia. So he was like, if I asked him like, why is it like this in Islam? He was like, no, it just is. And then, uh, cause probably he heard that from his parents. Um, right, it was natural for him, yeah, he grew up yeah. with it. Yeah. But when I asked my mother, she had actually read like why the rules are there. 
So she never used that. Like, oh, it's because it's the sound. So she was like um, uh, sitting down with me, talking about like why uh, why it's recommended to pray five times a day, for example. And she's like, God doesn't need you to pray. It's it's supposed to be for yourself. Like it's supposed to be something you need to right. take like those five minutes throughout the day to just sit back and think about like all the important things in life. And she was like always um, talking about it in other way. And and uh, that inspired me to like go uh, read about it myself. Uh, so it just have become a part of me and hijab is a part of my identity, it's a part of who I am. And I'm very proud of it and I'm proud of showing it. Thank you. That was really, really important. Um, I guess you have a, a very brave and powerful mother. Thank you. I, think you got, I think you got some of that from her. Thank you. <laughs> Go ahead, Noah. So uh, next, you were an exchange student in Jordan? Yeah. So um, I'm kind of wondering, how was the culture shock like for you? Was it was it weird being a Norwegian in Jordan? Or, you know, how did that go? Uh, first of all, Jordan was, uh, in my eyes, amazing. Um, and I was very excited to go because um, uh, and I, I feel like uh, that kind of showed me how um, influenced we are by the media. <laughs> because I was thinking like, oh my god, Jordan is probably just desert. Uh, it's probably like nothing to do except going to school and that's what we're going for. Uh, so I was like really just going for school and, and looking forward to it. And then I came to Jordan and it was like, so much different than I thought. Uh, and they have like everything, they have an ocean, they have the Dead Sea, they have the desert, they have the city, big city with like all the stores and malls and restaurants and uh, they have nature. So it was like totally amazing and I uh, I, uh, I just, I really fell in love with uh, with Jordan. Yeah. yeah. Um, what did you learn when you, when you went to, to Jordan? I mean, apart from obviously you studied there. What do you think was the biggest takeaway from that experience? I think uh, because in Jordan, uh, the majority are Muslims, so um, it was it was weird to suddenly feel just like everyone else, um, and uh, that's like a feeling I've never had before. Um, and then uh, and and like many people went in Jordan, but many doesn't as well. Um, but no one really talks about it. It's just like it's a personal a choice. Yeah, it's a part of the culture. Uh, people choose like some somebody wears it, someone or someone don't. Uh, but it's not like a big debate in the country. Like, are we gonna stop this or? Uh, so that was it. Was actually just really chill and uh, just uh, living. Yeah. Nice to get away from some of the pressure then. Yeah, it was. Yeah. It was for four months. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> and what did you study there? I studied Arabic. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> that was really awesome. Yeah. So I was able to actually talk with the uh, local people on their language. That was also very cool. We learned the most from the Uber drivers, I think. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> They're always very chatty, the Uber drivers. <laughs> um, okay. So. Uh, we'd love to hear about your podcast with the Norwegian Refugee Council. Um, so she has a podcast about refugees, war, and peace. Um, what motivated you to help tell refugee stories? Um, it was while I was in Jordan. Uh, the last week, I, I wanted to do something while I was there. Uh, so um, uh, my manager took contact with uh, the Norwegian Council for uh, refugees, and then um, and asked if it's like possible to to have the time to make anything happen, and then they said yes. Uh, so the last week, I was able to visit um, uh, the third, the world's third biggest uh, refugee camp in Jordan. Uh, and it lived like 80,000 Syrians in there. Um, and then I was able to talk to some of the refugees that's living in shelters. Uh, 
and then uh, since I had like already been there for four months, I could speak directly with them uh, in Arabic. Um, and then I remember like the last day I was there, we sat in like a circle with uh, I think there were like twenty young refugees, and uh, I asked them like, what? Um, can I, as a Norwegian, go back to Norway and take with me? And what kind of message do you have? And what can we do? And all they said was like, can you just bring home our stories? Can you bring home what you saw here? We just want people to know how we're living. Yeah. Um, so, so what did you see? How are they living? What, what, what did you, you know, share on the first episode of the podcast? Um, well, first of all, uh, I've always wanted to go inside a refugee camp and see with my own eyes how it is. Uh, and I was uh, in a very organized um, refugee camp because it's been so many years. Uh, we're at the ninth year of the Syrian uh, crisis. And, uh, and so they have been, been there for nine years. Um, and what was very special was like seeing all the kids. That's that was like, they have been born and raised in the refugee camp, and all they know of the world outside is only stories from their parents. Um, and they were so positive, and they were so happy and glad for me to just come there and be there. And uh, they didn't know about scum and sauna, so they were like, oh, it's they were just so happy that I wanted to use my time to come in and listen to their stories. Um, that really moved me like, I think uh, I've always uh, like I often think like okay, what can one person do? You know, it's so because it's so big and it's so much numbers. And, uh, you see all these pictures and it's just so much. So it's so hard when you don't know like okay, what can I do? Uh, and then they were like, oh, we just want people. It's about knowledge, you know, uh, and to make people care. And then uh, so. And then just see how they go to school. They they take um, different classes, uh, preparing to some days start working, um, without even knowing if they're ever gonna actually be able to use the education uh, and courses they're using. But still, they're so motivated and they're so just waiting for an opportunity. Um, and yeah, and that's just really got me to think about how. Blessed we all are. Mm. Wow, that sounds like a really powerful experience. Um, and uh, so you, you're bringing guests on the podcast, right? So other uh, Norwegian celebrities or experts around, about refugees and the refugee crises. Um, you had Marlon on an episode? Yeah, I had Marlon on Marlon in the first episode. Yeah, yeah. Can, you, can you talk about that and yeah. sort of you know, what, what he brought and what sort of experiences he was able to share from his travels as well? He was uh, actually the uh, first one to, to have been ambassador for Norwegian Refugee Council. And uh, it's from him, I heard about them. And he was like so positive, and they were, he was like, they're doing such a good job. Um, and then um, he went to, um, he made like Marlon's journey on Instagram. And he went to three different countries. Uh, to talk with different refugees, uh, with uh, fo focusing on the young ones. Um, and a year later, he sat in this room and we talked about it, and he was like, thank you for making me talk about this and, and remembering how grateful I am. Because he, he talked about how hard it was to come back and then just living like a normal life again after knowing how people are living somewhere else um, and then uh, and we like throughout the podcast we don't only talk about like with the refugees or the refugees but okay why are there refugees in the world why are there wars uh, are there any rules in wars what happens if people don't follow the, those rules why doesn't the countries that have the money and the resources to help doesn't help? Uh, so this uh, how yeah, has people deal with the trauma? Um, and uh, the last episode is about like how will the next ten years look? And uh, uh, yeah, so it's it's like 
very many different topics you can talk about when you talk about drug use. And I think it, it's a topic that um, many people don't necessarily know about because it's you know it's covered in the news for maybe a few minutes and then not anymore, right? Like the Syrian refugee crisis for nine years, but we don't really hear about it in the mainstream media. Yeah, and anymore. it's because all, like if you if an expert comes on television and you have like ten seconds to talk, it's right. like okay, then it's gonna be numbers, it's gonna be facts, it's gonna be and they have to be like very strict. Uh, but now they can sit in this room, in this chair, and they have time, and like they have so much information and knowledge, they can just share it. And uh, when they use physical words, I just, okay, what does that mean? <laughs> so actually, we understand what they're talking about. This. Yeah. Wow, that's really, really cool. Thank you for doing that. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> um, we have uh, one or two more questions that Noah and I have prepared, so if anybody wants to Again, line up in the center to ask your own questions to Iman. You're welcome to do that, and we'll go to you in a couple minutes. So uh, you are you know, such a, a positive role model and a shining light for uh, young Muslim women. Um, but I think, you know, speaking for myself, for, for many other people, too, who have seen the show and who look up to you and your portrayal, um, what, uh, what was it that you know, really inspired you to share your message of, of love and peace and just kind of, you know, your, your general message that you're sharing to the world. Where did that, where did that kind of motivation come from for you? Um, I think it comes from my religion, for me, uh, because it's like, that's, that's what religion is for me and that's what I learned that it means uh, in my home. And uh, uh, I think it's so important, and and um, it's easy to like focus on the negative things, and it's easy to like to see the hate, and and um, uh, and it could be like from the outside or from yourself, uh, and then it's so important to have people that just focus on the positive, because for one negative. Uh, Word, you need seven positive words to weigh that up. So I think that says something about how easy and why we always so easy to focus on the negative. And if someone said like some one bad word, you will think about it like the rest of the day instead of like the 20 other good things that happened. Uh, so yeah, it's just and and life is so stressful. We have like it's it's like we have so bad time. <laughs> Uh, and we're gonna rush, and like, and then uh, we have all these goals, and when we make it to one goal, we're just ready to hop on the next one. Um, and then, so I think it's it's like time to just breathe. And and uh, I've just had like an exam period, <laughs> and I finished my last one yesterday. Congratulations! Uh, thank you. <laughs> so it's been uh, it's been uh, so it's and and like. Usually when I have an exam, I'm like, because uh, I'm one of the late ones that like realizes I have an exam two days before I have one. Oh, yes. And then uh, I think like instead of, uh, and sometimes I just, oh, it's too much. I see all these three thick books and I'm not gonna be able to read them, I know, before the exam. And then just, okay, but you have those two days. It, doesn't, it takes a longer time to think about all the things you have to do. Just start. And then you take the exam with the knowledge you get in those two days, mm -hmm. and you can do more at that time. Yeah. So when something feels big and overwhelming, your advice is just start yeah. and see where it goes from there. Yeah. Yeah. Just keep I'm going, done. and even though it's going slow, it's going somewhere. Right. Progress is progress. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, so final question for me. So I know you said acting isn't something that you want to pursue with your faith, but you still remain in the public eye with your activism. So I'm wondering if you would want to talk about what's up next or what you want to do. What sort of other activism would you like to get involved in? Um, uh, I've never said like I've never wanted to do acting, but I haven't done any since since right. this come. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I've been um, I'm, I'm going to school. Uh, so this summer, hopefully, I'm finishing my bachelor degree. That's all yeah. Thank you. <laughs> So that's like the plan for the next uh, semester. Uh, and then, um, 
think I'm just gonna uh, work and uh, have fun and then um, we'll see. And I'm like, I'm like plans. no, because I'm, I'm like a person who um, I don't plan like very long time ahead uh, because I think that closes your eyes for many opportunities. So if you know like in five years I'm gonna be there and then there, it comes up an opportunity and then you see that that's gonna make that I'm not there in five years. So you say no to the opportunity and you never know where that opportunity takes you. So if I if I was like very focused on something else besides of school, when I got the opportunity to join SCUM, and I know people that was like, oh no, I, I never went to the audition because I thought like, I didn't have the time. So I was like, if I was one of those uh, who felt like that, I wouldn't be here now. So that's why I'm like, seeing the opportunities come and then decide then. Awesome, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I think we're ready to move to our audience questions. Again, will you share your name and where you're from before your question? Hello again. Hi. <laughs> My name is Amanda, I'm from Paris. So, I was wondering if uh, you have the opportunity to uh, participate to another scam remake like Carl, you would be interested to get a part in another scam remake like France or Italian, like Carl do it in, uh, in the Netherlands, you know, you would be interested. Um, if you would be interested in taking a part in another scam remake, as oh. her own character or as a different character? Um, no, like your character, like how yeah, you know, did it in, uh, in the Netherlands. It took right. right. the right. character oh. in the Netherlands. Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely, I would. Yeah. What remake do you think? Um. Hmm. <laughs> uh, I think the language I can learn like quickest is the German one. Because <laughs> it's close to Norwegian, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I guess that one. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. 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 Hi. Hi. I'm Antonella from Italy. And Hi. Uh, my question is, in your opinion, uh, will uh, Sana and Yusuf have an happy ending? Will. Sorry, say that again. Uh, if Sana and Yusuf will have an happy ending. Again, will they end up together? Will they have a happy ending? Will Sana and Yusa oh. stay together? Yeah. Yeah. I think is the question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I hope so. I think so. <laughs> yeah, in, my, in my head, they have a happy ending. Yeah, I yeah. do think so. And uh, if he comes back from Turkey, of course. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Julia and I live here in Rome. Uh, first things first, uh, I think what you said was really inspiring and you are an inspiration for me. Uh, <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, I think <laughs> uh, my question for you is when you read when you first read the script of the first season of Scum, was there something particular that you were scared about uh, people's reaction of how would they have reacted? Um, about something that was uh, scripted? Um, well, first of all, I was uh, scared of people's reaction from the first episode. Uh, because uh, you have like the part uh, that doesn't like Muslims in Norway, and then you have like the Muslims who mean that a <coughs> Muslim girl shouldn't be in a series with alcohol and party. So uh, I was very excited of, of both the, both the sides, and um, and suddenly it was like I would be the face of a girl with hijab on their television. Um, so, uh, but when it kind of started, and and I had to come to a, a point where I was like, you know what? I have my family, I have my friends, uh, and those are the ones that love me and uh, care about me, and as long as I have them. I need to stop worrying about what other people think. So that's like what went me through, uh, through, especially the first season. And after that, it was like very okay. And you know, Julia was very um, uh, good at communicating with us. So if there was any problems or anything, we would just talk to her. Uh, and she wanted like the best for us as well. So the rest of the, the 
time was actually very good. And the girls as well, in, in real life, we were very supporting to each other and, and helping each other and we talk about things with each other. So, so yeah, we got us through. Thank you, I love you. Thank you. <laughs> Any other audience questions for the moment? Go. Go. I'm Lacey Hi. from Hawaii. Hi. Um, wow. <laughs> uh, I was wondering, uh, throughout Joining Scum, did you change your mind on anything? Uh, any issues or anything like that? Um, I feel like um, like throughout the, the series, I think all we all actors learned a lot actually. Uh, because you know when the, if there is a scene that is played without Sana, then I'm not on set. So there were, there were many scenes that I saw like for the first time at screen as well. Uh, which I learned things from, um, like in Yora's uh, season where she talks with this, uh, the brother of um, uh, William, uh, like the, those things many people don't know and, and uh, yeah, so I, there were some things that we actually learned from as well. Um, and I think like all of us, because we knew like kind of what the series would be about, uh, so I think all of the actors had like some kind of mission or some kind of um, uh, yeah feeling they wanted to portray in the in the series as well. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Yeah. <laughs> so we spent time with yeah, Syrian refugee camp. Yeah. We spent time with children. We only know that by growing up there. So I want to ask. Can you share what they taught you? I um, uh, didn't get to talk a lot with the Syrian children. It was more like the youth that was my age. Um, uh, but what I saw or what I like got to learn um, is how they hadn't thought about that the children had traumas and the children had uh, trauma nightmares uh, because uh, it's normal for children to have nightmares so many of the children hadn't told their parents that they had that they had trauma nightmares because they don't know necessarily the difference um, so uh, they, they realized like the kids many of the kids were coming at school very tired and this was ruining for their learning uh, because they had stayed up at night because of the trauma nightmares. Um, so now they're like working in, on a program that will um, to help the children to, because uh, they focus a lot on like grown ups to be able to get back to their lives and, and dealing with their traumas and not so much on the children. So that's why they're now teaching both the, the teachers and so the teachers can use it with the children. Um, to actually start focusing better on school. So that was absolutely something I had never thought about. Hello. Hi, Hi. will you share your name and where you're from, please? My name is Jessica. I'm from the US. Hi. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. um, so I wanted to ask, what advice would you give to people, especially young people, who feel different from their friends, like if they have like cultural differences in their own friend group? Um, being different is, um, I think you, it's your choice what you um, make with that, that you're different. So I grew up in a place where there were like no Muslims. So I was, I was uh, clearly different because some people can like feel different on the outside and some people feel different on the inside. Um, but I feel like it was up to me if I wanted to um, make that thing that made me different to something negative uh, or, or being a victim because I was different and not like looking like everyone else or if I wanted to take that one thing that actually made me different which means it made me unique and make it to something that is me, to something that I'm proud of 
and something that is cool. So, so I think just um, it's your own mind that decides who you want to be, no matter what other people uh, are telling you, and there's no one else that defines who you are except yourself. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm 32 years old and, and I'm still working on trying to see the things that feel different about me as, you know, a, a superpower rather than, you know, a liability or something that's bad, right? So we can we can turn those differences into something that we can have as our own unique thing that we have to give to the world. That's true. That's a superpower. I like that. <laughs> I'm trying it, you know? Yeah. <laughs> It's hard, but yeah. that's what we're trying to do. It's hard, and it's a process that will take like for the rest of your life, I think. Yeah. yeah. And some days are easier than other days, yeah. right? Yeah, for everyone. Love that question. Thank you, Jessica, from the US. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, all these questions have been great. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Hi, I'm Georgia from Rome. Hi. Uh, so my question is for, uh, it's, since it's Christmas soon, what's your gift a list or wish list? Um, I have actually been so focusing on buying for others that I haven't thought about what <laughs> I would like. Um, um, I've actually been so, uh, it's been a very hectic period this last uh, half year. Uh, and uh, I've been um, like spending more time with strangers than with my own family. Mm -hmm. So um, for me this Christmas, I just wish to spend time with my family, actually. Yeah. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Any other audience members would like to line up? You're welcome. Oh, it's Kate from the UK. Hi, Kate. <laughs> <laughs> traveling as well and and uh, um, I really love tra because you know in most countries most places you have like these places where everyone goes and, and uh, sometimes on vacation I can actually hear more Norwegian than, than like the local language because it's a place where very many like Norwegians go uh, and the menu is on Norwegian and um, yeah so it, it doesn't like really work. Like uh, in Antalya, in Turkey, the, there's the waiters like talk Norwegian. They're like, oh hey, hi. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. They don't feel like interesting. Yeah. So, so uh, and um, uh, yeah. So there are not like some of these places. These I try to avoid. So I, I, I um, when I want to travel, I want to like experience like uh, culture, food. Food is very important. And and uh, new people, the the like hearing the language. Um, so on, on uh, our honeymoon, actually, we went to this uh, very local city in Turkey uh, that was called Patara, and, uh, and uh, it was so sweet, and, and uh, it was nothing like fancy except uh, the villa we were living in, uh, but, but they were like, the restaurant, for example, was in people's homes. And, and they were, there was no menu, they were just like, today I'm making this dish. Uh, it's your choice to eat here or not. <laughs> so I was like, okay, and then we sat down and, the, and this woman made some food and it was like the best Turkish food I've ever eaten. And that's because, the, and they just plucked out like the, the food from their gardens and it's, uh, yeah, so it was very like uh, quiet, not many tourists there. So um, yeah, that's like the, Best, freshest memory I have from my traveling now. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds really lovely. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so we've got uh, a minute or two left, and you know you mentioned your honeymoon, and we know you've got married recently. I'm wondering if there's you know anything that you want to sort of share about the experience of you know 
choosing your person and you know getting married and just the sort of you know has that changed you um, is there anything you would like to share about that yeah well first of all he's here with me yeah. <laughs> Hello. Yeah. He's trying to hide uh, exposed <laughs> yeah <laughs> trying to sit there in the back I see <laughs> and uh, um well, we got married. We're gonna have our uh, six months uh, anniversary wow. here in Rome. Wow. Yeah. Congratulations. Congratulations. <laughs> uh, yeah, so we went to have it in Rome, so we're just staying for a few days. And uh, um, yeah, we uh, met for one and a half year ago. And for many people, we uh, got married very fast. Um, especially in Norway, it's like normal to uh, have been living together for 14 years and having two <laughs> children before you marry. Uh, so we just decided to do things like the other way. Um, and uh, it's like I, I, I have very strong opinions on many things, and, and uh, one of them was like, who would, who would be my husband? Mm -hmm. uh, so um, we were very clear from the start, like. Uh, we wanted something serious, um, and then, uh, and I've always wanted, like, known I was going to marry someday, uh, and then it was just about to find the one I wanted to marry. Yeah, and spend the, my rest, the rest of my life with him. Yeah. So sweet. <laughs> and, yeah. So when you knew, you knew. Yeah. You knew, you knew, yeah. Um, and, uh, you don't have to, it's private, but would you mind sharing how you met? Yeah, we met on a <laughs> on a, uh, um, a volunteer uh, uh, event, uh, and we uh, he had he had uh, uh, colored his hair yellow, uh, and uh, so it was very easy to notice him, and because uh, he was uh, being a DJ at a um, event in in uh, Oslo. Uh, and then I had filmed like, and then we talked a little bit, uh, but I was still, I had like three weeks left of my military service, so I was just at home for like two days. Uh, so I was filming the event to like share it on Instagram. And then he wrote me this message, like, oh, I look like a yellow um, uh, Easter bunny. <laughs> and, then, and then I was like, oh, and then I went in and I was like, oh, it's him. And then we started talking and then, uh, yeah. Really? That's really sweet. Yeah. <laughs> I met my husband volunteering also. Yeah, that's nice. Okay, now you know where to go. <laughs> uh, so we do. We have time for one, one more question. question. Yeah. Julia's back. Hi. Welcome again. Hi. Uh, did you expect to hold this success for the, the season? Sorry, can you repeat that again? Did you expect all of this success? Uh, no, I did not. I did not expect uh, of this success, um, and I um, I don't think any of us did like because it's since it's like the first time something Norwegian, uh, especially like since yeah many years many years have been so big. Um, it's not like something you expect before it happens. Um, so I remember like the first meeting we had before Scum came out, it was like, okay, uh, you have to pre be prepared that, I know you're excited now, but it, like sometimes it, we try to make series and no one watched it, watches it, so we have to close it. And we was like, yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> and then like just the opposite happened. So, so I was like, I think we were more prepared for the opposite than, than actually this happening, yeah. And then we thought like, okay, but how many people in the world talk Norwegian anyway? So it won't be like more than five million people who sees it. And then we took wrong again. So, so it's been yeah. absolutely um, amazing. Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, you know, it, it speaks to the power of the show and you know, focusing on one person so specifically in their experiences. Even if you don't share those experiences, you can relate to them, right? Because you can see they're making mistakes, they don't know what to do, they might screw up sometimes, but we find them to be lovable anyway, right? So for me, that was one of the really powerful things was seeing, I can accept and love these characters despite their flaws, despite their mistakes, so I should be able to give that same acceptance to myself. 
So for me, that was one of the most, um, you know, moving things about the show, and I think that's, you know, one of the things that makes it so universally relatable. So thank you. Aww. Thank you. Anything else, everybody? Thanks. Thanks for, Thanks for the claps. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So yes, we are at time. Thank you so much for your audience questions. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. This was really, really